we're going to start with a few questions that um, Jerry and I prepared, and I'm going to hand the microphone to Jerry. Thanks so much. The country seems to many of us to be more politically polarized than at any recent time. Does this polarization present special challenges to the court? Do you think that the court has contributed to this polarization? And are there ways, are there any ways the court and the justices might address this polarization? Let's start with the last. I don't think we can do it directly. I mean, I think the best thing, my father gave me this advice uh, when I was growing up. And he says, the first thing you do is you do your job. You know, and do it as well as you can. And when you do your job pretty well, then maybe people notice, maybe they won't, but at least you've done it well. And the job of the court is not to opine on politics. And it is not to get involved in politics. I think we can help the best, and it may be, you see, because of the polarizing and so forth, which I read the newspapers too. <laughs> and I listen, I mean, I heard uh, Nicholas Kristof say this. He said at a talk. He said, why is it? He said, because he writes about things abroad, and he just written about frightful circumstance in the Congo where half a million women were raped. It was terrible. And he says, I can more easily get my editor, instead of running that article, which is of the most amazing impact, he says, no, they'll want to run an article because he said people won't read it. But you put a Republican and a Democrat in a room screaming at each other, everybody will watch. Problem. So I guess from our point of view, what it comes down to is be extra careful to be fair in your arguments, to be sure that you're taking the other person's point of view into account, and as dispassionately as possible, explain why you reach your result. That's the kind of thing I learned in law school, all right, and I've always uh, uh, believed in it. And it has to be believe in it because you don't know if it'll work, but I think that's the best we can do. In recent years, it has become very difficult for an appellate court or even a Supreme Court nominee to get confirmed by the Senate if they are at all candid about their views on controversial constitutional issues or even their basic judicial philosophy. Do you think that the judicial confirmation process is irretrievably broken? Well, I was confirmed. <laughs> <laughs> that was some time ago. Uh, but I do remember that experience. It was fairly stressful. I mean, I'm on one side of the table, and there are 17 senators on the other side. And, and uh, everyone was saying, oh, you're not going to have a difficult confirmation. I mean, how did I know that? And moreover, how did I know why well, I kept thinking, how do they know? You know? I mean, you don't know exactly what's going to happen because they'll ask the questions that they want to ask. And those questions will be questions they believe that their constituents want asked. And if they aren't very good at figuring out what their constituents would like, they won't be in their offices for very long. So, so I thought it sort of thought, I, I mean, I hope it works out all right, I thought. And actually, I was pleased I was confirmed. But I'm sitting there pretty nervous about it. And I know it's going out over television. And millions of people will watch it. Luckily, I was incredibly boring, and they turned it off. But the, 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 the fact is that, that uh, if people decide no, it's going to be no. And they have any reason they want. I think the American public is pretty tolerant. And I think they will accept the views of people who don't agree on particular issues. If they think the re person's reasonably open-minded and seems willing to listen to other people and just, uh, you know, doesn't seem, I, that was, that's just an article of faith. And anyway, it worked out all right with me. So, I think this. I was not, I understand the, the, the complaints that are being made, but I was not a person who did, so, so I suppose I hadn't been confirmed. I would have thought, I hope, would have been very mature of me to think this. But, but I would have thought, look, what this process is, is it is a kind of democratic window through which democracy is brought in to an aspect of the Constitution that is not democratic. Once I am confirmed, people can't do anything about me. Very unlikely, I'll be impeached, we hope. Uh, the, the, but the, 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 uh, there we are. I'm not democratically elected. I have a certain amount of authority, and they can't do much about it. So we have a system that sort of through the 
this, air, this, this confirmation process and the selection process brings a democratic element into it. It's a kind of messy compromise of the, of the kind we often find in our government. And I would have thought, perhaps, well, that's the verdict. I can't do anything about that. There we are. But that would, as I say, be mature of me. The, the, had that happened. Anyway, it didn't happen, so I don't feel happy. But the point is that I make to you on this, and I understand the problems, is that I was not the nominating person. I was the nominated person. I was not the confirming person. I was the confirmed person. So to ask me about whether that's a good or bad process is a little bit like asking for the recipe for chicken a la king from the point of view of the chicken. Uh, recently, in testimony to a congressional committee, you revealed that you had Facebook and Twitter accounts. That I'd looked at them. Okay. And I said I had had Twitter, which is true. The reason I had Twitter for a reason. Should the Supreme Court, in light of your eloquent um, uh, position on the need to explain, the need for the court to explain its decisions to the public, should the Supreme Court have a Facebook page as a way to share its work with the public? Oh, you better know why I had Twitter. It was actually pretty interesting for me. Because when they had that revolution started in Iran, I suddenly started looking at this unbelievable. And the way you could get it minute by minute was to sign up for Twitter. So I signed up for Twitter, and I looked at those, uh, at those pictures, which fascinated I've never put anything out in Twitter. I have no followers. In fact, <laughs> in fact, as far as I can tell, only one person has ever requested to follow me. That was my former law clerk, Tim Wu. <laughs> I said no. <laughs> so, so it is not a good idea for us to get into conversations with the general public via Facebook and Twitter. That would be my view on that. How but we do have a SCOTUS blog, and uh, I'm, that seems to be working very well. And, and they say they're like a, a million hits a day or something, a huge number, huge number of people. And they get the opinions immediately, and they can follow a lot of the argument. And that's evidently big success. How do you approach discussion with fellow justices on a new case that invokes issues on which the court has been sharply divided in the past? Well, it depends how recently and how, how, how divided. I mean, if it's recently divided, they pro we probably don't have the case because there was no point going into it again. Um, if it's something where you feel people have really made up their mind, you'll keep the discussion fairly short and just say, I've said why, da, da, da. But if there's room for people, I mean, you know, they haven't really expressed themselves, you, you, you might say, I know you think this. Say, I, I know you think this, but have you thought about you see, are you sure? So, so uh, when we had uh, the um, uh, question of, of whether the Second Amendment uh, applied to state action, I wrote a dissent. It was a dissent. But I tried to write it on saying, well, I don't think the earlier case was correct in its interpretation of the Second Amendment. I will assume it was. I, I must now. I lost that. And, and therefore, still, I have some reasons here that the majority might consider as valid, and I listed those reasons ex trying to explain why I thought it was not applicable to the states anyway, and I was no more convincing the second time than the first time, but you wanted to know what approach I would take, <laughs> and that was the approach I would take. You're trying always to think about what's important to some other person and make certain that you address that and that you explain why uh, that is not satisfactory. And, uh, but most of these cases are not decided before, and there's a lot of open room, and the vast majority will listen pretty carefully. People listen pretty carefully to each other around the country. In the warm-up uh, act before you uh, came on stage, the audience was listening to some excerpts of several of your particularly well-known oral dissents, including your dissents in Lopez and Parents Involved. But oral dissents are quite unusual. Usually the opinion is announced by the author of the majority, and he or she simply states that some justices dissent. 
So how do you decide to dissent orally from the bench? I think uh, you will not, no, I will not, and others feel the same, want to do it more than once or twice in a term, keep it minimal, and be sure it's in a case where you really feel that this is seriously wrong, and you also feel it has significant implications. For example, um, let's see, I, I did, what was, uh, <laughs> I heard a long dissent in, uh, not too long. It was involved uh, this bankruptcy case last term about whether the bankruptcy judges uh, uh, deciding counterclaims uh, violated the Constitution separation of powers. I felt pretty strongly about that. I wrote um, what I thought was a very convincing argument in dissent. And then when I sat back, I thought to myself, this is not a case that the general public is going to consider a do or die issue. <laughs> so I said nothing. But parents involved, I thought, was a very important case. I thought it was very important, and I thought the court was wrong, and I'd written down my reasons. And so I, I certainly, I, don't, I couldn't do that. I, I spoke for a long time. I spoke for about 20 minutes, and I wrote a very long opinion. I usually rarely have an opinion more than 20 pages, and usually they're between, between 10 and 20, closer to 10 dissent. This was about 70 pages long. I thought if I really think they're wrong, and a dissent is, if on the bench, two or three minutes. Well, it was 22 minutes long. That's the best I can do. Punish them. <laughs> Make them a, <laughs> but uh, uh, so that, that is probably the one I felt the most strongly about, or certainly one of the court releases oral arguments to the public now at the end of every argument session, mm -hmm. but it reserves the release of other public sessions, including oral announcements of opinions and dissents, until the end of the current term. Do you think the court would be better served by, by allowing the public access to these public sessions when they occur, or does it make what do you mean? Are you thinking of oral arguments? Yes. Well, oral arguments are announced, are released to the public at the end of every week of oral we, uh, Could we do it in the, uh, bit by bit as they go along? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Why not? <laughs> uh, to, whom do we, to whom do we pose that question? Well, obviously not me. <laughs> <laughs>